All right, here we are for our last and final unit, which is all about electricity. First, we're going to look at some of the concepts that you would have learned in grade nine and review some of those and get a handle on everything. Sometimes we learn lots of things, but we don't see the big picture. So let's take a big picture approach to electricity. Well, first of all, the word electricity kind of gives away what it's all about. It's all about electrons. Now, later in physics, you will learn that really electricity can be applied to any charged particle. Anything that has charge. There are lots of particles that are charged. Um, the electron is probably one of the most common ones, and then of course the proton. But why does an electricity involve protons then? Well, it can um, if you had a proton sort of by itself. But as we're going to see in a minute, there's a reason why the electrons get all the attention. And there are also many other charged particles that you'll learn about as you take uh, physics further. Uh, particles within the nucleus of an atom, particles that are, you know, don't, they don't last very long, we don't live for very long, they're very short-lived particles that uh, come and go in interactions, but they have charge too. So technically, electricity is any charged particle, or anything that has charge. Charge is the property or the thing that electricity is all about, all right? You could say that gravity is all about mass, because mass is what makes gravity work. And so for electricity, it's all about charge. So why is the electron extra special then? Why did we notice? We, it must be special because we called it electricity after the electron. We must have noticed the electron first. So let's take a look at why electrons are really what electricity is all about. Well, the way things work in our world is that there are no such thing really as electrons flying around on their own, unless, of course, we set up situations where that happens. But for the most part, we find that there are atoms. The atoms have protons in their nucleus, right? Positively charged particles, which are also part of electricity. And then they have little neutrons that are neutral, which have no charge. So electricity doesn't really involve neutrons. It doesn't have that much effect on them. Then we have our little friends, the electrons. Now, they're not jam-packed into the nucleus. The nucleus is jammed together into an extremely tiny space. And protons and neutrons are held there by an extremely strong force called the nuclear strong force, which means it's very hard to get in there and mess around with protons. And if you did, the, you would have to overcome the strong force with such tremendous energy that you would have you know, nuclear explosions. Messing with the nucleus of atoms causes really, really big stuff to happen. So we don't often see that in our everyday lives. But the electrons are somewhere outside of the nucleus. They kind of exist in a, in a sort of state of nobody's really sure where they are. But we do know something. We know that they have very defined levels of energy. And so wherever they are, whatever they're doing, we can, we can at least specify where they're most likely to be. But they're out here, and they're kind of darting all around and buzzing all over the place, and they're in several places at once. And it's a very hard to understand how electrons actually work. But the fact that they're all over the outside of the atom means that whenever two atoms come together, Whenever two atoms come together, it's the electrons that tend to bump into each other first. Right? The electrons of one atom are going to meet up with the electrons of another atom. And this is why, most of the time, matter repels matter. You can't push a brick through the floor because right here, between the brick and the floor, this is an atom of the brick on the right, and this is an atom of the floor on the left. When they get close together, these electrons being negatively charged push against each other. You learn that in grade 9, the laws of electric charges, right? Similar charges repel. Now, sometimes what can happen is that the electrons can get jiggled around a bit. Um, we have seen that 
if we take two atoms and bring them close together, perhaps they might share electrons or give an electron from one to the other. And you learned all about bonding, chemical bonding last year and in grade nine. Chemical bonding involves atoms that are doing something with their electrons. So technically, chem chemical bonding is actually a kind of electricity, believe it or not. But it's not a kind that we see in our everyday lives. Most of the stuff we come across has already been bonded. The action is all over. Once the atoms have changed their electrons back and forth, it's all done. So chemistry is actually a kind of electricity for the most part. What else could happen? Well, instead of uh, these atoms bonding or switching electrons back and forth, what if we imagine that on this line I'm going to draw, that this side happens to be an atom that is on the outside of, say, a rubber balloon. A rubber balloon. And over here, this happens to be an atom that's on the outside of your hair. Well, when you bring a balloon close to your hair, then the electrons of the rubber balloon begin to get very close to the electrons of the hair. And what's possible is that in the rubbing, okay, the electrons get rubbed off. Let me explain how rubbing off might work. If I use yellow, which you can't see very well, but here, there's a force here, isn't there? This electron is being held to its nucleus by the attraction of negative and positive charge. And the same is true for this electron. Now, I haven't drawn specific atoms here. These are general atoms. Um, so the numbers of protons and, and electrons aren't accurate. But if we, if we imagine what might happen, if the atom on this side came very close to the atom on the other side, there would be a pull by the other nucleus on some of the electrons that were attached to those atoms. And if that pull is strong enough, this would happen while you were rubbing the rubber against the hair, right? the rubber balloon rubbed against hair. And if this were to happen, what would this electron right here might decide to say, gee, I'm not sure who's pulling me harder anymore. I'm not sure where I should go. And so perhaps he will sort of bounce over here and become attached to the hair, or vice versa. In fact, I think in the case of hair and balloons, just to keep everything really accurate, um, I'm thinking that what would happen is the opposite. So let's redraw it. Let's just draw it like this, because this could happen too. Let's put uh, Mr. Electron back where he was. So he's the rubber balloon electron. Maybe when they get close together, the electron on the hair gets pulled in by this nucleus. And maybe he decides, gee, I'm being pulled over there. Maybe I'll go over there. And so suddenly, he jumps over here and becomes sort of attached to the rubber balloon. Well, that creates some problems, doesn't it? Because you know in electricity, everything kind of balances out, pluses and minuses. And so what happens is where you had hair and rubber before, you now have hair that's lost an electron. So the hair somehow has lost an electron. And the balloon has somehow gained an electron. If you gain an electron, which is negatively charged, you'll have extra negative charge, which means overall you will be charged negatively. And, of course, the uh, hair, which has lost a negative electron, means there's now an extra positive somewhere that isn't being matched up. So it would have a positive charge. And so we see that we can develop charge, or we can create, I guess the best way to put it would be imbalances in charge by rubbing things together and getting those atoms close enough so that the nuclei of one can sort of tug on the electrons a little bit and pull them over. And so we can create what we call static electricity, which is all about the buildup of charge or the transfer of charge by transferring an electron from one place to another. So the first thing you learned about in grade nine was static electricity. 
Uh, I didn't mention in detail the laws of electric charges, but of course those should be in, in your head because I'm pretty sure you learned those all the way back in elementary school, probably grade three or grade four. And that is simply that opposite charges uh, attract each other and similar charges repel each other, right? So we'll just assume that that's common knowledge. But static electricity is what develops when electrons are transferred from one place to another. And it's really that simple. When this happens, um, this creates an imbalance of charge or in charge. That's just a fancy way of saying you get something that's positive and something that's negative. And you remember uh, that it's the gaining of electrons that makes you negative and the losing of electrons that makes you positive. And so this can happen in many different ways. The most common way of doing this is by having things rub together. This happens in your dryer, when you have clothes that are rubbing against each other. What's key though is this really wouldn't work unless you had different materials. If both of these atoms I had drawn were identical, then they would their nuclei would kind of pull with the same force. But if you have different atoms made of different materials, you'll have larger nuclei with more protons in one and smaller nuclei in the other. And of course, it's not even that simple because each of these atoms would be attached in a way to other molecules and compounds. And so it's a little bit more complicated in trying to determine why an electron would get pulled one way or the other. So instead of going through all the details, you probably remember seeing something called the electrostatic series, which is just a chart. Electro, let's write that correctly. Electrostatic series. Yes. Static series. Which is a chart, and usually what it does is it lists a bunch of substances like things like uh, hair. Right? You may have used the like acetate, which is a kind of uh, plastic, I guess you could say. Uh, it'll have down the bottom things like gold, uh, iron. A lot of the metals are down at the bottom. Uh, rubber is usually somewhere up here. And I'm just guessing at these. I'm not sure what the order is. But they're listed in order. And the order is uh, basically how tightly they would grip or hold or attract electrons. And we find out that um, of all of these things, gold would have the strongest hold on electrons. So the, the hold on electrons gets bigger as you go down the list. Now you could write this list upside down, and you could all be upside down too. But the idea was that if you had two substances, say you had hair, and you had rubber, well, whoever is on the bottom or lower on the list would be the one that would grab the electrons and the one on top would be the one to lose them. So in this case, if we run the hair and our rubber balloon together, the rubber would grab the electrons and become negative and the hair would become positive. So this chart is a short form or a shortcut to figuring out all of the little details in terms of how the atoms are bonded and how they're molecularly joined to each other and which one has a better hold on each other. Um, so that's the theory behind it. But the chart is basically much easier for us to use. So we can create a chart by doing all kinds of experiments and testing which ones get the charges. And that's really what static electricity is all about. And you learn that if you create charge, then suddenly there's this desire for the charges to equal out. And that's really the key to electricity. And I find when I was learning electricity that they avoided that point. They never really talked about that. So I'm going to talk about it for a minute. What happens when you rub electrons from one place to another and you create this imbalance in charge? Well, I want you to envision some ground. Let's say there's ground here. And let's say I decide to build up, pile up dirt so that my ground gets higher over on the right. And I create a slope, right? We call that a slope or a hill. 
Or uh, another thing we can call that is what's called a greed. In the old days, they called it a greed. And uh, in fact, just as an aside, they used to have a, I'll, I'll draw it down here and erase it. When you build a road made of gravel, you have to build your road with a bump in the middle. This is exaggerated. But the reason for that is so that when it rains, the water will run off the sides and it won't create big puddles in the road. So there is a difference in height between the middle of the road and the edge of the road. Just like there's a difference in height between the right side and the left side of my picture. A difference in height is called a green. And there's a big tractor that we use, a big tractor that has a, kind of looks something like this. And it has a big blade underneath here. And uh, what it does is it drives along, and it is called a greeter. Not a greeter, like grating cheese with a T, but a greeter because the job of this tractor was to go over the dirt roads over time as cars drove on the road. I'll raise my water here. What would happen is that the road would get bumps and divots in it, and the top of the road would be all sort of bumpy and messed up like this. And the grade would be destroyed. The grade is not correct anymore, the, the difference in height. And of course, you would get puddles filling up and mess on the road. So the grader would come by with his plow, and his job was to restore the grade, to plow the gravel around and, and make it nice and smooth again so that it had the proper grade so the grade would wash off. And that's why it's called the grader, because it grades gravel roads. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of gravel roads anymore. So graders now, their main job is plowing snow. But in the old days, that's what they did. So greed. And the reason I'm introducing that word greed is because it represents a difference of something. If you look at my picture, we have a high spot and a low spot. And there's a difference between them. And so the difference between any two things, that's one when one is higher and one is lower, is called a gradient. And this word is very important in biology, chemistry, and physics. But we don't talk about it much in, in high school. We just talk about slopes. But a slope and a gradient are really kind of the same thing. So when you think about math, and you think about all the mathematics you learn with slopes, what you're really doing there is learning how to describe what we call gradients, or differences. And those gradients are critical. Because here we have what's called a gradient in height, or a hill. But what happens if I envision charge in the same way? Let's say, how would I make a hill with charge? Well, it wouldn't be a physical hill that we can watch, but it would be a difference. If I envision on my gradient of uh, dirt, my slope, that high would be a positive area, and low would be a negative area, and maybe the middle could be zero, then the difference between positive and negative represents high and low. But I can do the same thing on my electricity gradient. If I create a positive charge and I create a negative charge at the same time, it's kind of like creating a hill of electricity, which is kind of weird. But it's the same idea. So when you think about electricity, and you think about rubbing two objects together, and how the electrons are traveling from one to the other and creating a charged object, I want you to think about it actually creating in your mind like a hill of electricity. Now, what happens when you create a hill? If you have a ball that sits on the hill, well, guess what it does? It rolls. It doesn't roll when it's flat, but it will follow the hill and try to go in a certain direction when you have one side higher than the other. Now, balls have mass. They respond to gravity and so on. That's why hills work. But electrons work exactly the same way. And for that matter, so do positively charged protons. So if I put a little proton on my imaginary sort of hill, all right, a proton, guess what he's going to do? He's going to roll down the hill. Now, remember, it's just a figurative hill. It's a model. It's not a real hill. But you can visualize that by remembering that he will be repelled by this positive at the bottom. And he'll be attracted by the negative over here. Or sorry, positive at the top, right? And he'll be attracted by the 
uh, negative at the bottom, which is in a sense what causes him to roll down his hill. So up here, it was the force of gravity that caused the motion. Here, it's what we call the force of electricity that causes the motion, but it's still the same idea. It rolls down the hill. Now, here's the weird thing. With hills, you only roll down. But with electricity, because we have, it's able, you're able to move both positive and negative charges, right? There's only one kind of mass. So you can't have two options. But there are two kinds of charge. So although positives kind of roll down the hill the way we would expect, guess what negative charges do? Because they're negative, it's like they live in backwards land. And they just do everything backwards. And so a negative electron, if you placed it at the bottom of the hill, it would roll uphill. Obviously, it would be attracted to the positive, and it would be repelled by the negative. So it's possible to see some weird things in this one. You can, it's like a hill, but it's a hill where things can roll both ways, where positives would roll down and negatives would roll up. And that's kind of a preface for where you're going to go next year in grade 12. But for now, all I want you to focus on is the fact that a gradient is a difference in height, or it could be a difference in charge, or it could be a difference in concentration between two solutions, which I think you may have done in chemistry. You may have talked about concentration gradients. That's where you have you know, a solution that's divided in the middle by some kind of membrane, and you have a very high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other. It's just like a hill, high to low, high concentration. And what happens? Well, if the membrane is permeable, there tends to be a movement of the molecules towards the low end. So it's kind of like they're falling down the hill. So you see, all gradients can be explained by thinking about a hill. And um, it's a very important concept in biology, chemistry, and physics. So what we're doing when we talk about static electricity is we're making hills of electricity. We are imbalancing charge, creating gradients, charge gradients. All right. Now, the reason I'm stressing all this is because I want to link this now to the next concept. In grade nine, you learned about electrical concepts, and you, you used some interesting analogies to describe them. But those analogies aren't really that good. Once we move on, we have to kind of go beyond that. So I want to introduce for you a new concept that you've heard about, but talk about it differently voltage. All right. Actually, there are three concepts, voltage, uh, current, and resistance. We'll talk about those a bit later. Perhaps when you were in grade nine, you talked about an electric circuit, and you envisioned that an electric circuit is sort of like you know, uh, a pump. Let's say you have a little pump here, and water pipes. And the pump pushes the water around the pipe. And you probably said the voltage is like the pump. Well, that's not a really bad example or analogy, but it's kind of incomplete. What is really happening here? Well, what we sometimes use as a, a word or two words to describe voltage is a potential difference. You probably saw that in grade 9, too. Potential difference. Well, what does that actually mean? What is potential and what is difference? Well, the word difference means one minus the other. And that's like saying a difference in height on a hill. A high point, right? You can find your height by subtracting from, from the highest point. So the word difference is what hints at the fact that voltage is really associated with a gradient. There's a grade or a hill of charge. So what happens is if we rub two objects together and we create one object that, that uh, loses its electron and becomes positive, and another object that gains electrons and becomes negative, we create a hill. We create a difference in charge, right? Where one is positive and one is negative. So there's a picture of my charge hill. Now, if I transfer thousands and thousands of electrons, I'll make a very steep hill. The difference in the charge would be bigger, wouldn't it? So if I transfer just one tiny electron, maybe my hill would be very, very shallow, not very steep at all. Maybe my electron hill would, or electric hill would only be this big. 
But if I transfer tons and tons, if I really rub the balloon over and over on the hair and get on many of the molecules involved, maybe I would make it into a steeper hill. So the steepness of the hill depends on how many electrons are transferred. The more you transfer, right, the steepness of the gradient, steepness, put it in quotes, or the, 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 the value of the gradient, depends on how many electrons are transferred. What we do is rubbing together. All right. So let's say we rub quite a few electrons and we get this fairly steep hill okay, of a charge. Well, guess what happens? There's now a tendency for charge to move between these objects. These electrons over here that have been rubbed off are at the bottom of the hill. And remember, what do electrons do in their backwards world? They suddenly feel the tendency to roll up the hill. Just like if you put a ball on a ramp, it has a tendency to roll down. Unless you stop it, it's going to roll down, isn't it? Put a ball on a hill and see what happens. Unless you stop it, it will roll down the hill. If we could take a proton and stick it on here, well, the proton would want to roll down the hill, just like the ball. But remember how we said protons are stuck in the nucleus and can't move very easily. It's only the electrons on the outside of atoms that are really have any freedom to move. So we're not going to consider protons moving at all. We're just going to consider weird electrons that roll up hills. This electron is going to roll up the hill unless we stop it. Those electrons got rubbed off, but why don't they just roll up the hill and go back where they came from? Why are they not moving back? And the reason for that is because between the two charges, there is something else. Between the two charges, there is air. Air is a different substance altogether. Air. The electrons would like to roll back, but the air is stopping them. So it's like this electron wants to go up, but somebody has put a big block in their way called air. Now, why would air block an electron from moving back? Why can't it just jump right back from the rubber balloon back to the hair it came from, and everything would be normal again? Well, that's because air is what we call an insulator. So you would have learned about what insulators are and also conductors. And you learn that conductors allow electrons to move easily through them. Whoops, I'm writing my words twice. Allow electrons to move easily through them. Whereas insulators, um, electrons move, can move, but much more, it's much more difficult takes a heck of a lot more energy to move electrons through air, which is an insulator. Uh, again, I can't write today. Difficult. Difficult. And we know that there are substances. And the reason, of course, is because of the way that the atoms and molecules are bonded together. Uh, in general, generally speaking, uh, most atoms keep a very close tie on their electrons. So if you have a carbon atom joined to a carbon atom, and another carbon atom, and another carbon atom, right? These electrons are kind of going around here, and the electrons of this carbon atom are going around here, and they might be sharing a little bit, right? Because of a covalent bond. But for the most part, each carbon atom kind of knows where his electrons are, right? Each carbon atom's electrons are staying pretty much close, aside from the one or two being shared. There's not a whole lot of movement. However, in other things, like metals, let's take little iron atoms. Iron is a good conductor. Actually, carbon does conduct electricity to some degree, too, but uh, you could use any atom besides carbon. Let's put nitrogen atoms in there if you wanted to. So okay, nitrogen is not a very good conductor at all, right? Um, of course, nitrogen wouldn't share in four ways, but you get the point. 
Maybe we'll go back to part of it. The point I'm making is that this would be an insulator, the atoms of an insulator. So the electrons around each of these atoms of an insulator, maybe I'll put, just put A for atoms of the insulator. The electrons are being held. Now watch what happens with iron. Iron, this particular atom, he comes to the party and he has electrons. And at first the electrons are all over here, but then later they take a little stroll over here and over here. And after a while, he doesn't know where his electrons are. They're all over the place. They're visiting neighboring atoms. He doesn't care though, because this guy also brought his atoms to the party and they're all visiting too. And then of course, so did this guy bring atoms to the party and they're all visiting too. So the electrons are everywhere. And then lastly, this guy's electron. So at any given moment, even though the electrons are scattered all over, every atom is happy enough to, because it has enough electrons around it. That's different. It's kind of like going to a party and there's a fridge. And so there are two kinds of people. Some people come and they bring their little case of Pepsi. There's a little case of Pepsi. And they put it in the back of the fridge and they put a little sign on it that says, this is mine, don't touch it. So when they go into the fridge, they can drink their Pepsi and nobody else will touch it. And everybody brings a little box of their own and inside the fridge it's all labeled and you have to drink your own pop. Because what happens if someone else drinks your pop and you don't have any, right? But other people might go to a party and they might be different. They might say, oh, well, everybody just bring a bunch of pop. And all the pop goes in the fridge and who cares whose it is? Because we realize that there's going to be enough to go around for everybody. So you can just reach in and grab any pop you want, regardless of who brought it. That's what we call metallic bonding. The electrons are all over the place, and nobody really cares where they came from, as long as there's enough to go around. Whereas this kind of bonding, uh, the bonding we see in covalent compounds and, and ionic compounds and such, is different. The electrons need to kind of stay close to home. They all have to stay in their own little box labeled mine. Which means that if you're trying to push electrons through here, this electron gets pushed in here, and he's like, boom, he bumps into all these atoms who are saying, hey, no, no, you can't come here. I, this is my box. This is my pop. Stay away. Stay away. So it's very hard for this electron to work his way through here, right? Or it's very hard for him to jump onto this atom, and then this atom give one to this guy, and then this guy pop an electron off over on this side. They don't like that. Because it's like, well, I, I don't want that pop. I brought Pepsi, and that's a Sprite, and I don't know, and that's very difficult. Whereas over here, an electron jumps in, somebody pops in a Sprite, and it's like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll take the Sprite, you can have the Pepsi, you can have this, you can have that, well, and over here, another electron can pop out easily. So the electron can, it, it's, it's not actually one electron that zips all the way through, it's like, a, it's like a, a, an effect where it's like bump, 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 bump. An electron pops in at one end and pops out at the other, and who cares where it came from? And that's much more easy to do in metals, which is why metals are usually good conductors. Um, but insulators are usually a different kind of material with different kinds of chemical bonds. All right. So if air is an insulator, we're almost done here. If air is an insulator, and I rub two objects together, my plus and my minus, and I pull them apart, and in between we have all this air. Well, the electrons are wanting to roll up the hill I've created. I've created a gradient of charge. And the electrons that are here are really wishing they could roll up here, but they cannot because the air has stopped them. Because air does not allow electrons through. Now, if I bring them closer together, if I bring this charge closer to this charge, I'll get this kind of idea. I still have the same hill between them, right? Because I haven't changed the charge. But by bringing them closer together, there's only a tiny bit of air inside here. Oops, um, I need to pray on there. There's only a tiny bit of air inside. And so, if that's the case, there is what we would say less resistance. If you have to push your way through a crowd, it's easier to go through a small crowd than a big crowd. So at this point, the air might not be enough of a block. And the electrons inside there, who are still just desperate to roll up this hill, are going to say, woohoo, let's go. And they'll go, and they'll jump through the air. Now, of course, 
they're pushing their way through this crowd. If you have to push your way through this crowd of electrons, as, as we did over here, it's kind of like, you know, it's not as simple as, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me, excuse me. And every time you bump into electrons, you create a tremendous amount of energy, vibrational energy, which causes this whole thing to vibrate and produce heat. And so because of all the collisions and bumping, and it's not just as simple as sliding right through the, you know, the iron here. You slide in and somebody, okay, whatever, slide one out, no problem, we're all good. No heat, very little heat anyway. Here, a tremendous amount of heat is uh, produced. This is like trying to push your way through a mosh pit at a concert where everybody's packed in there. It, you know, you've got to bump into a lot of people. And so what we see is the electrons deciding. And it's a big enough hill, right? It's, the hill is steep enough. The charge difference is enough. We're going to go. We're going to roll. But we're going to push through the air to do it. And so when we do, we heat up the air and we create a little spark which is really just super hot air. Air that's been heated up so much, it makes it's like a tiny little lightning bolt. A little lightning bolt. So this little spark appears. Now, here's the cool thing. Air will block electrons, but if you make the hill steeper, what if you made a bigger difference in charge and made a very steep hill? Well, then the electrons would be willing, this is a bigger hill, woohoo, right? It's more fun to roll up this hill. So they would be able to go through a bigger chunk of air. The steepness of the hill determines how badly the electrons want to roll or move. And the steepness of the hill is the difference in charge or the charge gradient. So the difference in charge is what we call the voltage, sort of. It's, we're not quite there yet, but it's, it's related to the voltage. And the uh, steepness of the hill is the voltage, and the insulator is what's trying to stop the electron. How could you get a steeper hill? Well, you have to do a heck of a lot of rubbing plastic or rubber balloons on your hair to get anything more than a tiny spark like this. But there is a place where this happens, and it happens inside clouds. Inside clouds, there are giant convection currents, warm air rising and cool air sinking causes the inside of the cloud to be very turbulent. And all the drops of moisture inside the cloud are being churned about by this convection current, which means there's a lot of rubbing of water molecules, which means charge develops in clouds. And in some places, you'll get positive charge. And in perhaps another cloud over here, you'll get a large region of negative charge. And guess what happens? It creates a hill of charge, a gradient. And the electrons that have gathered over on the negative side would really love to roll up the hill and get to the other cloud. But the air is in the way. However, there's a lot of moisture in a cloud. Clouds are huge. And there's a lot of electrons, which means this is an extremely steep hill, which means this time the electrons will be thinking, let's go. And this time they will go and heat up the air just as before. But instead of a tiny spark, they make a gigantic lightning bolt. So instead of a little right, super hot air expanding makes the noise of a spark sound that you hear sometimes with a spark. Um, but then with such a big spark, you get this huge superheated air, a large type of bolt, and the great sound of thunder. But it's all because the electrons are trying to roll up the hill. And they have to do it by pushing through the air, which is an insulator. OK, one more thing to discuss then. So we get the idea. We get the idea that if I can create two opposite charges, I can create a hill. Well, now the only thing left to do is to find a way to measure how steep the hill is. All right? So the way we measure the hill is with energy. There's a certain amount of energy associated with each hill. And so the energy that would be used to move up or down the hill is what we're going to use to determine voltage. So we have energy, and energy is the same as work. Remember from our last little, little uh, unit, two units ago, work and energy are the same thing. And work is force times distance. So you see how this hill of energy, electrical energy, is actually a hill of force and distance. And that's how the force gets in. That's how we start thinking about the electrons being pushed by this electrical force. All 
right? And we'll talk more about how that electrical force works later. So it's force times distance. Now, let's say we want to push a certain amount of charge. All right, well now we have to think about how charge is measured. And charge is measured in a unit called coulombs. A coulomb. And a coulomb is really just sort of like a way of measuring how many electrons have traded places. But of course, when we rub stuff together, we get millions and billions and zillions of electrons. One coulomb of charge is actually a huge amount of charge. You'll never get that by rubbing uh, rabbit's fur on a piece of plastic. To get a coulomb of charge, you have to have something even more impressive than that. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to know how much energy it takes to move a particular amount of charge. So energy is joules. That's how we measure it. And coulombs is how we measure charge. Coulombs. Okay. So voltage is a way of saying how much energy is required to move a charge up this hill. And it doesn't matter how far we go up the hill, because what we're really discussing here is the slope of the hill. And so voltage is basically energy per charge, per unit charge. That's the price tag of voltage. And I say price tag because we're going to make another comparison. Let's say you go to the bulk bar and you want to buy some sugar. So here's your bin of the sugar sugar at the bulk bar. Well, everybody's going to go in and buy different amounts of sugar. And that's like charge. Charge comes in all shapes and sizes, right? There's charge on an electron, there's charge on a proton, but if I have 20 electrons, I have more charge. I don't know how much people are going to buy. So instead of saying uh, what the price is of sugar, I can't say it's uh, $7. Because if I say that, well, that's only if you use a certain bag of a certain size. But everybody wants a different size. And since everybody is going to be buying different amounts of sugar, different kilograms of sugar, it makes more sense for me to say sugar is $7 a kilogram, the price per kilogram, right? And then it doesn't matter how much you buy. You just multiply by 7. So the price per kilogram is a more useful number in describing the bulk barn and shopping than just a simple price. The price per kilogram is more effective when people are going to buy all different amounts of kilograms. Then you just multiply by seven. So if you buy two kilograms, $14. If you buy three kilograms, $21. It's very simple. So voltage is like the price per kilogram of electricity. Instead of kilograms, we're not buying kilograms, or what we're doing is we're moving charge. So charge is like the kilogram. And energy is like the price. So voltage is the energy, not energy per kilogram, but energy per unit charge. All right, while we were paused there for the announcements, I added this in, so we don't want to copy that down. Voltage is the energy per unit charge, just like the price per kilogram. It tells us how much energy is needed for a specific amount of charge. And so with, with sugar, we tend to use the kilogram. With, uh, with electricity, we use the coulomb, which is the amount of charge. All right? And that's how we should th start thinking of voltage, instead of thinking of it like a pump or anything like that. But you'll remember that since energy is work, and work is force times distance, there is a force involved in voltage. And it can cause things to move. And that's what it does. It's the energy is causing electrons to move. So let's just summarize very quickly all what we have learned. We've learned that if you rub things together and transfer electrons, you can create a charge. It's the transfer of electrons. And you create a positive and a negative. In doing so, you create what's called a charge gradient, or a hill of charge. And charges will want to move along the hill. Negative charges, especially, will want to roll up the hill automatically. They don't need a push just like a ball rolls down the hill. And positive charges would roll down the hill. But we don't have to worry much about them because the only thing that really moves in terms of matter are the electrons. 
So we imagine electrons that want to roll up this hill, and they will do so. The steepness of the hill tells us a little bit about how badly the uh, electrons want to go. So the gradient of the hill right, tells us how badly the electrons want to roll. Now remember, the hill is really the difference in charge. So the bigger the difference in charge, the more the electrons will want to roll. It means a steeper hill. All right. And if we consider, uh, if we have one electron or 10 electrons or 50 electrons, we need to have a, a common way of, of measuring it. Then voltage, the voltage created, the voltage between two, two opposite charges, well, actually, it could also be, I suppose, the same as two similar charges. So we'll just write two charges. How's that? The voltage between two charges is the energy required to move a certain amount of charge. along the hill, along the gradient, up or down. Up if you're an electron, down if you're a proton. Uh, along the hill. Sorry. Along the hill. Okay. And that is sort of our introduction to electricity and the concept of voltage. And a lot of it is review from grade 9, but this new way of looking at voltage is something that you might want to study just a bit.